After 25 years, red-haired Shanks has shown us his true power. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! Oda has just cooked up the greatest reveal of One Piece since Gear 5 Luffy as Shanks in One Piece Chapter 1079 utterly destroyed the kid pirates, reminding them who their daddy, daddy is. <laughs> With his Conqueror's Hockey-infused Divine Departure, Shanks might have just ended the debate on him versus Mihawk because, let's be honest, bro couldn't even defeat Vista during Marineford, but Shanks just easily destroyed a crew and captain worth over 3 billion berries who have defeated another Yonko. Now, Mihawk might be a better swordsman than Shanks, but when it comes to strength, power, and hockey, the only people who we have seen come close to this dominance are Prime Whitebeard and Rock. Roger when they clash. He's out of line. But he's right. The only other dark horse left is Blackbeard, who is heading right towards Luffy. Hey, 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 hey! 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 Don't worry guys, I don't think Law has lost to Blackbeard. For now at least. This might just be one of the ships of a titanic captain being Aokiji. The reason this makes sense is because last time we saw Kuzan was in the cover story of chapter 1064, where he and Van Arger kidnapped Pudding. Their infiltration of Totoland was happening during the events of Wano, and that's how Pudding is later seen to be with Blackbeard in the same chapter. Later, we see Van Arger is with Blackbeard fighting Law. However, Aokiji is missing. After capturing Pudding, they likely realize that although she possesses the genetics of the Three-Eyed Tribe, she doesn't possess the true awakening required to hear the voice of all things and read the Poneglyphs. In chapter 854, Pudding herself suspects that hybrids like her may not be able to achieve this ability. However, the person who might possess the knowledge to manipulate her lineage factor and awaken her powers would be none other than Vegapunk, the genius scientist. With Kuzan being a former admiral, he had the authority and clearance to know about everything going on with Vegapunk and his research. This timing is also perfect for Blackbeard to bring a person like Vegapunk to his side, since, you know, the government wants to kill him. Furthermore, there is also a thematic link between our Kiji and the events of Egghead Island. Similar to the Ohara incident, Egghead and Vegapunk are marked for annihilation due to their curiosity and thirst for knowledge. We know Kuzan's brand of justice is the exact opposite to Akainu and the world government. So him finding out about their plans to completely obliterate Egghead, similar to the Ohara incident, will prompt him to go against this decision. Because what has Vegapunk done to deserve such a punishment? Yeah, he has created seraphims and technology that could be used to harm others, but you you can't blame the hammer maker if someone smashes a head in. The fault is on the world government if these tools are used to harm innocents. Just like how Kuzan helped Robin because he deemed her not to be a threat or when he didn't game end Luffy in Long Ring Long Land, Kuzan will instead help Vegapunk, the man who rescued his friend Jaguar D. Saul. Also after hearing the destruction left by a buster call, Kuzan is clearly opposed to any future outcome like it and Egghead is seeming like it's becoming one. It looks like the arrival of Aokiji will lead to a confrontation between him against Kizaru and Saturn in the sea outside of Egghead because even though we in the community think Kuzan is undercover for Sword inside the Blackbeard Pirates, the Gorosei and Emu's ideology opposes Sword so to them he's still a nuisance. Whether it's Kuzan or Blackbeard himself who have come to Egghead, one thing is for sure. The world shattering event the narrator spoke of in the last chapter might have to do with the down fall of Imusama. We know just how big of a threat Egghead and Vegapunk posed to Emu through them sending 100 warships, 4 admirals, Kizaru, and even a Gorosei member to Egghead. All while we learned from Akainu how they don't have enough manpower to handle all the craziness going on in the world currently. The main reason for all of this precaution isn't because of some weapons Vegapunk possesses. It's to do with the information stored there. Just like in the real world, information and knowledge are one of the biggest weapons you can use to mobilize the revolution. We have already seen how a tiny spark and motivation can lead to defiance from oppressed people around the One Piece world. Especially since they're being forced to pay tribute to the Celestial Dragon's world government to protect them from pirates. But the government is doing no such thing 
thing as we saw with Lulusia Kingdom in chapter 907. It wasn't the marines who saved the citizens from the Peachbeard Pirates, it was the Revolutionary Army's generals, which sparked the citizens to rise up against the ruling king, unfortunately being wiped away from the map by Imusama. This notion is reinforced with Oda deliberately showcasing how the marines are plundering innocent nations as in the case with Whitebeard's hometown. However, the knowledge of the Void Century, Sun God Nika, the unlimited power source, and the true reality of the world where it's not a coalition of nations in the Reverie who form a world government, but there is a king on the empty throne in Imusama would send shockwaves throughout the globe. We also already have a way for the world to learn about this truth instantly through Big News Morgans, who is flying above Egghead and is itching to publish a story on the events of the island. This will lead to the first domino dropping for Emu's downfall. In fact, all of this is supported by the name of this arc being called Egghead. This relates to the Humpty Dumpty rhyme as pointed out by Typical Joe on Twitter. Humpty Dumpty and Egghead having a great fall is a metaphor for the downfall of King Richard III. He was depicted with a humpback and defeated at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Therefore, Humpty Dumpty and Egghead is a foreshadowing used to refer to a regime that will fall and break. Similar to how the events unfolding in Egghead will cause irreparable damage to Emu's 800 year rule. Moving back to the chapter, a few hours before the present, York realized that the government ain't ever going to make her a celestial dragon. Instead, they want to kill her just like the rest of the satellites. This is ridiculous, man. Ridiculous. But don't worry, because York had another genius plan. She ordered all the Seraphims to kill everyone except her, Stella, and Cypherpole agents captured in the underground lab. She then asks S Snake to turn her into stone but revert her back once people aren't looking, which worked into fooling not just the people in Egghead but the entire One Piece community because all the allegations shifted to the other satellites after she became a statue. York also gave S Snake another order which sends her flying somewhere in the present which isn't revealed to us yet. Finally, we move to Elbaf, where the battle between the Kid Pirates and the fleet captains of the Red-Haired Pirates has begun. The captains tell Kid how they won't let him even see Shanks. He's done for now because they got Shivering Purupuru, Ballfingers Gentito, and Dentures Fugat on their side. Who? Yeah, so it turns out the captains of Shanks' crew are complete fodder. Now, these aren't the commanders whom we know have one of the highest bounties out of all the other pirate crews. These are like the captains in the Straw Hat Grand Fleet like Barto. Shanks, realizing they're about to get completely annihilated, tells them to fall back and ventures into the battle himself. Lucky Roo does tell him to chill out because he and the commanders will take care of it themselves. But Shanks tells them that Kid is still a pirate with 3 billion berry bounty, so they shouldn't underestimate him as a youngster. He ain't wrong because Kid did defeat Big Mom even though it was a 1v2. That just means he is half a Yonko, so the caution is warranted. Shanks asks Yasop if Kid has healed fully from his battles in Wano, just to make sure he doesn't need to hold back. Yasop confirms that he is in peak condition, so they needn't worry about embarrassing an injured man. Shanks also gets a few pages worth of intel from Hongo, telling us that he is a calculated man who doesn't just jump into battle recklessly. He confirms Kid is a troublemaker and does not particularly have a heroic reputation like Luffy. Thank you. On the battlefield, Kid activates his awakened damn punk, claiming that it doesn't matter how many ships there are or how many people because with his railgun, he can destroy all of them. Remember guys, Kid and Killer are currently using a very big brain broken strategy of if we don't lose, then we will win the fight. However, a little obstacle by the name of Shanks' future sight ability is on their way. This man, minutes before Kid has even fired his attack, sees a future where all nine of the ships ships in the red-haired fleet are destroyed. So Shanks takes his sweet time, sits down, drinks his cup of tea, and then commands the ships to spread out to left and right with Dory and Broggy covering the rear. He then jumps towards Kid with a supercharged hockey sword slash called Divine Departure. No way! 
Shanks' attack instantly KOs not just Kid, but Killer too, who was covering him. This wasn't any normal attack though, it was a replication of the Pirate King Rogers technique that he used against Odin. Which tells us that Shanks might have already surpassed Roger as this was the attack he chose to lead with. Shanks with only one arm was able to show an output to a much greater degree. But let's not forget, Roger had an illness and was dying while we saw him use this attack, so this matchup is debatable. Most of the top tier fights in One Piece have come down to a battle of attrition. From Ace and Jinbei drawing after 7 days of fighting, Luffy taking over 10 hours to defeat Katakuri or Cracker, so Kid getting one shot here just showcases how Shanks is the pinnacle of power in the entire series. Because remember, Kid was able to tank multiple hits from Big Mom, a Yonko set to be on the same level as Shanks. He isn't a fraud with his 3 billion bounty as Kid was also able to overpower Big Mom's hockey, turning her into a magnet and stunning her. So this one shot speaks volumes to Shanks' battle capabilities. However, you can make an argument that Shanks caught him by surprise with his strongest attack. As if he didn't finish Kid off in one hit, then he would get a chance to fire his damned punk, decimating Shanks' captains. But to say this was Shanks' strongest technique while it being a homage to Roger wouldn't make sense. It's like saying Luffy's ultimate attack is his red rock. Also, the surprise factor is not the case, as Kid had his guns out ready to go. The reality is, Shanks is just much quicker and more powerful. You can have the strongest gun in the universe, but if you can't land a shot, then you're useless just like my Valorant teammates. Another thing to note is Shanks being the god of hockey played a crucial role. Not only did he see 5 minutes into the future, but also is known as the observation killer. So catching Kid through disabling his observation also explains this fodderization. But this isn't where the disrespect ends. You can't keep getting away with it! Seeing their captain and vice captain almost dead on the floor in 5 seconds, Heat and rest of the crew offer all of their road poneglyphs to Shanks and beg to have them spared. However, Dari and Broggy from out of nowhere fire their Hakoku sovereignty attack which we saw back in Little Garden. They completely destroy Kid's ship, teaching the youngsters a lesson Higuma learned in chapter 1 that when you draw a loaded gun at someone, you must be prepared to suffer the same fate. Yep, this is the end of the Kid Pirate as stated by the narrator. With this, Shanks now has the Big Mom Poneglyph and the Wano Poneglyph on his hands. As we have mentioned before, he likely has the Road Poneglyph which disappeared from Fishman Island too. In which case, he is only missing the Zo Poneglyph, for which there is also a chance he already has that because Nekomamushi and Inuarashi were also traveling on Roger's ship alongside Shanks 24 years ago. If you want to learn more about how Shanks might have all of these Poneglyphs, then watch the video on screen right now.